Hello, Pastor Bob here with our sermon for what would normally be given on Sunday, but today we're recording it just a day or two early so that we'll all be able to see it at one time and one spot. Uh, before I go further, I want to thank Dion Grandin for being our audiovisual and uh, also running our Facebook page. That's been a real godsend, and I appreciate his uh, bringing his talents and abilities to this task. I hope this message is going to find you well today and in good spirits today. And if you've been struggling with the doldrums, you're not alone. I know that many people are. But one of the things I want to point out to you and continue to point out to you is that God is sovereign. God is in control. And you better just put everything on that and believe that with all your heart. Because as I often say, what really counts in this life is that we understand three words, faith, hope, and love. Of course, the greatest of these, Paul says, is love. What I mean by this phrase is this, that our faith fuels our hope, which expresses itself in love. And that's what we ought to be pursuing in these days. We're asking God to increase our faith. That doesn't change Him, but it does change us. And it changes our circumstances because God's ear is inclined to those who fear Him. So today, we're going to find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at uh, verses uh, 4 through 13. So I wonder if you might open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he held a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who ascended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we ask, Lord, as we always do, that you will teach us by the power of your Spirit, that, Father, you will give us grace in these days in which we are living. We find ourselves, Father, in a pickle at a time where it seems like we can't control one single event going on around us, but actually, Lord, that was always true. We just didn't recognize it. So now, Lord, we do, and we come to you, and we ask that you would help us, that we would seize upon your word, Father, as to life itself, and give us grace, Father, that we might realize how strong, firm, how great and magnificent you are, Lord. So teach us from your word now, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> it's interesting to me that when we're talking about the subject of oneness, the best that man can do is the Tower of Babel. Because when all men spoke one language and they acted as one, what they decided to do was build a structure that would let them climb up to see God and, in fact, just be God. God wasn't pleased with that because God wants oneness on His terms. And oneness is described in terms of himself, as we will see today. You know, it's always the strategy of Satan to fracture unity in the body of Christ. He does this with disputes. People get contrary with one another over one thing or another. He does this sometimes with distance. Uh, sometimes in relationship, we get distant with one another. Or sometimes physical uh, removal. We get far apart uh, in terms of mileage or whatever. Sometimes he does this in terms of disease, just like we're going through right now. Uh, I'm sure Satan in these days is preying upon the fact, that's P-R-E-Y, preying upon the fact that we can't meet together right now because of what's going on around us. So he uses disease. Sometimes people have leprosy. Sometimes people have the flu. He uses disease sometimes as a way to separate us and break up the unity. He uses divisions in the church with a number of uh, things. For example, people get doctrinally crossways with one another, or there's some sort of, you know, strategy, st uh, stratum of uh, financial uh, uh, separation. So 
There's divisions of the way people look, the way people dress, how much money people have. Sometimes people just get disenchanted because serving in the body of Christ or being in the body of Christ is a long obedience in the same direction. And sometimes it's easy to get disenchanted, especially if the enemy is trying to do that. Then there's just disorganization. People not using their gifts, talents, and abilities together, and so the church kind of gets disorganized, and that breaks up unity. I mentioned doctrine because doctrine historically has been one of the great divisions in the church. And then finally, just decorum. By decorum, I mean uh, how things are done, what color the carpet is, or the hymnals, or various other things. There's a lot of tools that Satan has used to break up unity in the church. And so what we want to look at today is the importance of unity to Christ in His body, the church. You know, one of the biggest and justifiable criticisms of the church down through time is related to the factions that exist in Christianity. A person who does not know Christ might look at the church and say, how can so many different views happen of one man, Jesus Christ? And that's a fair thing to say because it's a reasonable thing to point out that the church doesn't look like it's all after one person or about one person. It's important to Christ because he prayed for it on the night he was betrayed. In John chapter 17, twice, in verse 23 and again in verse 23, uh, Jesus is praying to the Father that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And he said that one of the things that will happen when we are one is that the church will know that the Father sent him. So unity is important to Christ. Unity is important to the church itself, however, because as we all know, there is strength in humble solidarity. And I mean that biblically speaking. Lots of people can be, have solidarity for various causes, but when we are biblically and humbly one, when we seek solidarity with one another, then we find that there's strength in that. It's an important issue because Paul's going to mention this in this passage that we read today. Uh, and he's going to mention it a couple of times. And I found in the Bible when God mentions something more than once, it's an important thing to take notice of. It also shows, though, that since Paul is praying about this and talking about this to the Father in heaven and to the church, it shows that it was probably a problem in the early church, too. Unity in the body is always a problem down through time. So let's talk about unity in the church. Well, the first thing to notice here in verses 4, 5, and 6 Paul's going to use the word one seven times. Now that's worthy of note because when somebody says something repeatedly like that, it is strategically and tactically important. And it shows this. First of all, it shows that God is one and he is the only one. You know, the Jews have a prayer that they pray every day. It's called a Shema. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 and 5 and following. And it's from the, where Jesus said the greatest commandment comes from verse 5 in this. The Shema starts out, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, that's the great commandment that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. But did you notice that in the Shema, it points out that the Lord God, He is one. And in fact, He is the only one. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul wrote, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Creeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, Paul's not talking about the mechanics of baptism here, like whether you sprinkle or whether you walk up into a baptismal pool. What he's talking about is some effect that happened to us because of our faith in Christ. When God gave us faith to believe and we were redeemed, justified, set free, as it were, from the penalty of sin, when we were forgiven of our sin, something amazing happened to us. We were baptized by the Spirit of God into Christ. Now, maybe this little picture will help you. Suppose, for example, I'm out on the ocean and I'm swimming. Well, I'm in the ocean, but the ocean's not in me. For the ocean to be in me, I have to drown. That means I have to forfeit my life so that the ocean then becomes part of me. When we come to Christ, what happens is we come into Christ, we're baptized into Christ, but the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ enters into us. In a manner of speaking, we are drowned in Christ. 
That's the act of baptism into Christ. We are totally consumed in, become part of Christ, and Christ becomes part of us. He now lives his life in and through us. And Paul says in Galatians 3.27 that we were all baptized into Christ. He said everyone who is baptized into Christ has put on Christ. So baptism is important here. And water baptism is just a picture of this baptism. It also shows the whole truth of the gospel, that Christ was a person, he was a man, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again. It's a baptism of all that, uh, a picture of all that, but it is also uh, a truth that baptism figures, prefigures, shows us, demonstrates to us what has happened to us in Christ. Well, our unity should reflect God's character. Since God is one, we should look like one also. Uh, even though many people worship many gods, the truth is there's only one, and he's Jehovah God, the God of the Bible. And so our unity should reflect that. God's people should show and reflect God's character. It's the whole point of God saying to us that you shall be holy as I am holy. In other words, we are sent as images of God. He created us in his image to reflect him, to reflect his glory. And so our unity should reflect God's character. Well, it doesn't. So where is all the unity gone? Where is all of our oneness gone? Well, I'll give you a couple of ideas here. The first thing is that our unity in the church is difficult because the faith has been compromised. Now, what faith am I talking about here? I'm talking about the faith once delivered that Jude 3 talks about. We're supposed to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. I like what Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote. He said, the tragedy is that men are trying to produce unity by telling us that it does not matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we believe. As long as we all come together and work together and do not argue about doctrine, we'll all be one. But the unity of the Spirit comes through understanding, not through discounting understanding, and saying that the knowledge of doctrine does not matter. The great characteristic of revival, that is where unity is the strongest, is that men understand that doctrine and the truth, that doctrine and truth in a way that they have never done before. Not only so, they begin to rejoice as they have never done before and are filled with an assurance and a sense of certainty of their relationship to God. You hear what Lloyd-Jones is saying? He's saying that we can't have unity if we throw doctrine out the door. We can't have unity if we don't all scrupulously obey the Word of God and the principles contained therein. But when we do, unity is assured. Revival is assured. So our faith has been compromised because many have crept in, as Peter talked about and also Jude talked about. Many have crept in. They're like uh, wolves in the midst of sheep. And they have deceived many people to think that some things aren't important. They have discounted things that are crucially important in the name of preserving unity by saying doctrine isn't important. So the faith has been compromised. But secondly, we have trouble with unity because of our nature, our sinful nature being self-centered and wanting its own way. You know, Paul rails out in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, he says, you know, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, for to will is present within me. In other words, I want my own way. And I find myself when I want to do good, I don't. When I don't want to do bad, I do. And he says, who's going to deliver me from this? And his answer is only Jesus Christ, who always leads us in victory. In Romans 8, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, we're instructed there that if we walk in the flesh, that cannot please God because the flesh is at enmity with the Spirit of God. So our sinful nature and our self-centeredness has kept us from having unity in the church. Well, what would examples of that be? Well, when I want my own way, even if it means that I have to press the point of the Bible and throw it out the window or under the bus, uh, that's me getting my own way no matter what. One thing you need to know about God is you don't get your own way. If you're going to love Him and serve Him and follow Him, you're going to get His way. And that's the point. But self-centeredness and our egos have gotten us into trouble and have destroyed unity in the church. Then there's confusion between unity and uniformity. 
Uh, many people think that unity and uniformity are the same thing, but they are not. Uh, I don't have to agree with you on every matter uh, to have unity with you. Uh, I don't have to look like you do to have unity with you. I don't have to talk like you do. I don't have the same, have the same accent as you do. I don't have to have the same social strata as you do to have unity. Why? Because unity and uniformity are different things. So Paul addresses part of that. And uh, I think it's one of the, the hearts of this passage is that Paul is going to show us that one way to have unity is to use the spiritual gifts that the Spirit of God has given every single believer. Now, he says this in, starting in verse 7 when he talks about grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And then he goes on about he ascended on high because he descended, etc. And he gave gifts to men, he says in verse 8. These gifts are important because they're charismata. That's the Greek. They are grace gifts. They are gifts given by God's grace into his church to build up the body of Christ. And so... We notice some things about these spiritual gifts, and these are important. However, I find that either they're talked about too much and abused in the church, or they're hardly talked about at all and not used in the church. So we need to find a better balance in here and understand what these gifts are and what they're about. So today's purpose is not to tell you what they are, but more to tell you what they're about. First of all, we need to know that God has given each of us an expression of his grace as a spiritual gift. In other words, he's given a job to everybody to do. This is also called a manifestation of the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives, he also equips us to serve God in a significant way. No matter how many times I talk to people about spiritual gifts, somebody will undoubtedly tell me, I don't have a spiritual gift. Well, yes, you do. According to 1 Corinthians 12:7. The Holy Spirit has given gifts to His people. You've got one or more. And often it's more. But sometimes maybe you just have one gift. So He's given them to each of us. That'd be my first point. And then secondly, these gifts are given at God's discretion. You know, everybody wants to be the star. Everybody wants to be the, the one in which the, the rodeo revolves around. But in the church of Jesus Christ, Christ is the one that it all revolves around. It doesn't resolve, revolve around people who have spectacular gifts or gifts that seem to be more in the public eye or not. The spiritual gifts are given at God's discretion. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He gives them to who, he, to who he wants to. They're not some sort of prize or reward. They are grace gifts. He gives them at his own pleasure. He can adapt the gift to the changing needs of the church in a changing society. He, they are given at the pleasure of the Spirit of God to equip and build up the body of Christ. That's their purpose. Now, that, that's the third thing here, is the purpose of those gifts. Now, I would say this. Spiritual gifts are not my, meant to flatter people who possess them. So, for example, if I have the gift of pastor-teacher, which I do, uh, just because I'm able to you know, state some things more clearly than other people or hash things out of Scripture that other people don't see, that's not something for me to say, well, <laughs> look at what I did. Wasn't that good? No. Or if I serve, you know, I can't outserve other people. The thing is not to distinguish myself. The thing is to distinguish the Spirit of God who gave us the gifts. The whole point of spiritual gifts is so that Christ will be exalted and His people will be built up. So the purpose of these gifts is to build up the body. That is why they are given. And then you need to, be under to understand that the church is meant to be interdependent. By that I mean that the whole idea of the church is that God gives these as He will so that we're all dependent on one another. And there's this fabulous description by Paul of, you know, about an eye and a toe and whatever. Parts of the body don't talk about which one's more important. We all need one another. Just like all the parts of your body are important to you. And as I've said before, just stub your toe some night and see how important that little toe is. You didn't think about it all year long. Maybe 10 years you didn't think about it. But on the night you stub it, you'll think a lot about it. All these gifts are important. Years ago, I used to do a lot of my own auto mechanical work, mostly out of necessity because I lived overseas quite a bit. So one night I attempted to rebuild a carburetor in my Ford Falcon. It was a 1962 Ford Falcon. And by today's standards, it was a really simple machine. 
I mean, after all, what could go wrong? So I ordered from Sears and Roebuck a kit to replace my carburetor, the parts of my carburetor, and everything went well until I finished and I noticed that there were leftover parts. Well, needless to say, the car didn't run up to specifications. It ran, but it was more like it had automotive COPD. And I think sometimes that's the way it is in the church. When we have parts that are left over, people sitting on the sidelines, people not using their gifts, it functions, but it doesn't function like it could. It doesn't function like the Spirit of God intends that it function. To run effectively, we have to have all the parts working together as specified by the manufacturer, who is the creator in our case. Well, then I would have you note that spiritual gifts are to be used in love. You know, love, of course, is the modus operandi of the church. Uh, Jesus said it very clearly. He said in John 15, 12, This is my commandment that you love one another, and he didn't stop there, as I have loved you. So it's very crucial that we understand that the use of these spiritual gifts, like everything else that happens in the church, should be done in love one to another. Uh, and in order to underscore the importance of love in the body of Christ, John wrote in 1 John 4, 8-12, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His holy, His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. So the spiritual gifts should be used in love. And then they should also be used in harmony. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, let all things be done decently and in order. Now that's important because it reminds us that a unit functions best together when all the working parts in it are working together. So harmony is a crucial understanding of how we use these gifts. Anyone who served in the military can tell you that armies are completely given over to good order and discipline. No military can function without them, and neither can the church. So that brings me to an idea. Maybe when we come to church, we ought to think more about following in a formation. Now, this was illustrated to me when I uh, went off to boot camp in 1964. Uh, you know, we were just a gaggle of people, you know, doing our own thing. Most of us were everything from hippies to, you know, beatniks to you name it. Uh, after all, this was the early 60s. And, you know, we became just sort of a gaggle. I'll never forget the first time we fell in to take, to take muster. You know, I don't know what we looked like, but it really didn't look like a military formation. It looked like just a whole bunch of people hanging together in a loose idea. So... As we went through boot camp, one of the things we learned to do was how to fall in so that we could fall in down a line and down a row and, and look like we were in order. You know, everybody was doing their part and everybody in that formation had a part to do. We had a leader out front. We had somebody carrying a flag. We had somebody at the right who was the, called the guide on who was right at the front right of the formation, the very peak of that formation at the front right row column. That person's critical because we all cue off of him. Everybody in that formation has an important role to fill. Church is like that. All of us have an important role to fill in church. If we're going to be one and move as one and follow our great leader, Jesus Christ, we're going to have to learn what our part is in that formation. So the first thing I would say is we need to find our place. In light of what we've seen talking about spiritual gifts, I hope you can see it's important that you find your place. When you're in a small church like ours, everybody's being in their place is important. Now, maybe if we were in a church with 25,000 people, you know, it wouldn't be so important that every ser servant who had the gift of service show up every Sunday. It might not show up so badly. But if you're down to less than 100 people, when somebody doesn't show and do what they're supposed to do or use their gift, it shows very badly and it really affects the body of Christ. So... Find your place in the formation. So here's some tips on how to find your spiritual gift. First of all, don't make this harder than it has to be. I mean, it sounds so obvious to say that, but I think some people way overthink some things. I mean, God's shown very clearly in His Word 
what these gifts of the Spirit are. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at some in Ephesians chapter 4 next time. Uh, there's some other gifts that are given through His Word. And I've taught on this subject before, but maybe we'll revisit it before long. Don't make it harder than, than it has to be. Just look for, for example, uh, the spiritual gifts that are taught in the Bible. I mentioned 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. There's Romans 12, 3 to 8. Uh, and follow the cross references in those uh, references there, and you can learn the purpose of the gifts and see some of those gifts. Uh, ask God to reveal to you how He wants you to serve Him. Here's a prayer for you. Lord, what do you want me to do? How am I to serve you in the body of Christ? Ask that and mean it, and the Lord will answer that prayer so you can understand it. And then look what it is that you're good at. You know, some of us have things that we're really, really good at. That might be an indicator of some spiritual gift that the Holy Spirit may have given you. Or, you know, look at things that you have a deep interest in or things that really touch you. Uh, look at what that might be, and that might be an indication of what spiritual gift you may have been given. Listen to other people. Sometimes people around you are telling you things and you're just not hearing it, or you're hearing it with a skewed understanding. But when somebody says to you, you know, I think you really are good at that. I think you really have a gift at that. I love the way you serve. Or I love the way you're the only one that notices when somebody isn't here. Or I notice how you gravitate immediately to people who come and visit. When people tell you things like that, you need to pick up on that. Because maybe what's going on there is the Holy Spirit's trying to say to you, hey, I've given you a gift. Learn how to use it. And then experiment. So you think you might have an idea of some gift that the Holy Spirit's given you? Throw it out there. Use it. Experiment with it. Try it out. And then seventh, don't, don't limit God. You know, don't tell God what He ought to do. Just listen to Him, and, and He will help you. He will guide you to the place where you can use that gift in the body of Christ. So what have we talked about today? Well, we've talked about the idea of oneness. That God is one, and so His church is one. That there's one head of the church. You know, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, that everything that God does, He moves as one. Why? Because that's the way He is. He is Father, Son, and Spirit, one God. So in the church, He's given many people, but one church. And so we need to find our spot in that church and the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us in that church. So let me give you three applications from this passage today. Here's the first one. Take seriously what Jesus took seriously. I'm serious. I, I don't know if there's that word serious again. I don't know how I can say this other than just say it. We run helter-skelter this way and that way, and we don't listen to what Jesus says. He takes unity serious enough to pray for it to the Father in heaven hours before He is going to be arrested and beat, and then a day before He's going to be crucified. Now listen, if that was going to happen to you, you'd only be talking about things that are really important to you. So what was important to Jesus on the night he was betrayed? Well, he prepped up the disciples in the upper room so that he'd give them some last-minute marching instructions. And then we are privy to the prayer that he prayed to the Father, and he prayed for us. He prayed for us because he prayed through those apostles out to everyone who be, would believe. And his prayer for us, including them, is that we would all be one, baptized in, by one spirit into the body of Christ. Let's take seriously this whole business because Jesus took it seriously. Secondly, we need to learn how to move with some coordinated precision. You know, some people get timid. You know, something looks hard to them and right away they're like, oh, I, you know, hey, you know, I don't know if I want to do that or not. Well, let's get a little more coordinated than that. The church needs to move from a coordinated and precise point of view. I mean that like... First of all, the absolute hallmark of precision is that we center our thinking around the Bible, the Word of God. And then from the Bible, the Word of God, we respond to that in a harmonious attitude of developing our doctrine around what it says, and then we all agree with that doctrine because God says it, and then we start moving as one. We learn to use those gifts severally that we have been given, but use them in one single idea, and that is to obey Christ and to walk in His steps. So we need to learn how to move with some coordinated precision. 
You can't watch from the sidelines, my friends, because my third point is this. By Christianity not being a spectator sport, what I mean is Christianity is lived in action, not lived in watching. Virtual reality has entered our thinking and our talking today. And sometimes we feel like we live vicariously through the characters or the animes that we play in various video games or watching television, uh, action adventure movies, romance movies, and sometimes we feel like we are drawn into these characters. And that's one of the things I hear people say, a really good movie is when you can suddenly identify with the characters. But people, that's a movie. Those characters aren't real. Those are actors. We are in the church of Jesus Christ and we're not actors. It's real. So there are no spectator sports here in the church. Everything involves something that is precious and important to God that we're going to do together in His name and march forward as one and get the job done that the Holy Spirit has laid out for us to do. Like what? Well, how about witnessing? Go into all the world and make disciples. That's clear. Uh, we're supposed to do that as one. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to do some individual evangelism, but what it means is that's a focus of our church. Our church is focused around discipling people for Jesus Christ. Or how about just for living for Christ day by day? We're living in what might be called perilous days. Okay, so we're in perilous days. What should we do in perilous days? Sit by the TV and watch it, hope it goes away? No, we should be active and involved. That means we're studying our Bible, we're praying, we're talking to as many people as we can by phone, by email, by you know, Facebook or whatever. We're enjoining people to realize that God is still in control. See, it's an active thing. It's not a spectator sport. We are in this thing called life, and you and I are in it until God calls us home. But as long as He gives breath, and gives life to this church body, we're going to be pursuing the things that Jesus said as a body we should be pursuing. So, let me leave you with this thought today. We're one because He says we're one, and because in reality we are one in Christ. That means that we need to think through, what is my part in this? What am I supposed to be doing in this? And of course, a valid question is, how important is this really? I mean, how important is church really? Well, how about heaven and hell? Because actually it is the church that holds the truth. We are given to be the ones who are the pillar and the ground of truth. In other words, the world's not going to hear about Jesus Christ unless we tell them. Because they're not running ads on CNN for come to Jesus today. It's the church that tells people. It's one person telling another person. It's one person discipling another person. It's a church discipling its membership to go out and to disciple other people. The church is the most vital thing on this planet. Why? Because God is God and He says it is. So let's come together and agree that during this time when we've got some time, we're going to focus our energies on rethinking and praying through and seeking God in His Word. Lord, how have you made me? What gifts have you given me? How can I use my gifts, talents, and abilities in your work? And how can I work with my brothers and sisters so that we might be one as you, Father, and Son, and Spirit are one? Let's pray. Father, help us today. Give us grace that in these days we might be pursuing Christ. That, Father, we might be more conformed into the image of Christ than ever before. Help us to lay aside, Father, all of our fears, all of our anxieties, and tr cast them upon you because you care for us. And Lord, help us as a church that even through this time when we can't meet together in a building, help us, Father, to meet together with you on our knees in prayer. Come before you, Father, not just with our concerns that are born out of our fears, but rather, Father, from an understanding that you have got this and you have got us. Help us to look for ways, Father, to make disciples, even in these troubled times, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a glorious day in Christ. He's still on the throne.